Hi, everyone. Welcome to Kambali 2020, a Rebuild Bali Festival, a digital program designed to inspire, excite, reconnect, and revitalize the Balinese and Indonesian community from October 29 to November 8, 2020. Kambali, the Indonesian word for return or come back, represents revitalization in the face of global challenges. The festival will unite people in Bali and Indonesia together with an international audience at a time when travel is largely impossible and creating connections is more important than ever before. I am so happy today to be able to introduce to you Febriana Firdaus, investigate and the topic of investigative reporting in Indonesia. Selamat pagi, selamat malam, Febri. Selamat malam. Yeah. Uh, I'm in uh, Washington. I'm in uh, actually in upstate New York, and about February is in Ubud, and um, we are going to have, I hope, a, a, an interesting and wide-ranging conversation about her life and her journalism, her new film that is coming out, um, and some of the fascinating work she has done throughout Indonesia. For those of you who don't know, uh, Febriana is an independent investigative journalist and. She's a regular contributor to The Guardian, um, where she has covered topics ranging from COVID-19 to the Black Lives Matter movement in West Papua. Her works have appeared in Time Magazine, Al Jazeera, Financial Times. Um, she uh, does work for Al Jazeera and writes about social injustice, indigenous communities, and stories of women across Indonesia. And I'm trying to remember where it was that we first met. Was it at Yayasan Pantau? Uh, no. We met first time in Ubud Writer Festival, I think like two years ago or, or like last year, but it's in the Ubud Writer Festival. And then uh, you were there like uh, sat in a table for the an annual dinner. And I know That's that right. and I want to say hi to you. And then I just approach you and sit in your table and I say hi. I I remember that, but I already knew about your work. And in fact, I actually, in, in my book on journalism and Islam, I cited a story that you wrote for Rappler um, about the so-called threat of LGBTQ, which, you know, um, but February has written, you are very brave. She writes about topics that very few other Indonesians are, are willing to really take on, um, you write about LGBTQ issues. You write about what's happening in West Papua. You write about um, you write about uh, female suicide bombers. Um, I, I thought, I mean, it's fascinating. And I thought maybe we could start by asking asking you to tell us a little bit about your own background. How where did you where did you grow up, and how did you become interested in all of these very controversial and dangerous topics? Yeah. Thank you, Janet. Um, I'm happy that you are the moderator because um, you're following my work and, it, and it's important for me. Um, yeah, um, this is like uh, the question that everyone always always asks to me that where did I came from and then what is my background and how I end up uh, being an investigative journalist uh, like today. So um, actually I was born in a traditional uh, family in a small town in Java, um, in Java Island, so mainstream. And my family is actually mixed between moderate Muslim and then my grandfather's who is like socialist. So I think it's a common, I think in, in um, Japanese family. So, um, most of from East Java, yeah, Java Timor. From East Java, because mm -hmm. um, um, before the new order, um, in East Java is like so many people like following Sukarno, like Sukarno follower, but also like uh, the member of um, the Forbidden uh, Party <laughs> that I cannot mention. So, so many people like this sympathizer, and then my family is mixed between the moderate Muslim and then um, the the socialist uh, follower. And then um, I, I grew up like uh, my, my parents and my family, that's how they taught me about the value of, of like being Indonesian. So I think like even it, I, my grandfather actually uh, was a political prisoner. And then um, 
he was jail and then uh, I I have we have no idea that of whether he was killed or what we have no idea and then um, but this political background of my grandfather affect my family that's why during the Suharto uh, regime we experienced something like um, the other um, political prisoner family that we don't have access to job, for example, and then um, I came from like a poor family. That's my so big. Could I? Um, this is. I was very fascinated to hear this that uh, your your grandfather was a political prisoner. I guess um, uh, at the and and so did that mean that your family then had the stamp on your identity card that because. Um, um, I have no idea about that. I have never asked about that. But my father, um, he is very close with my grandfather. So um, actually, my my grandfather is uh, the senior, and then my father is the junior in that movement. Mm -hmm. And then my father, during his life, um, um, during the new order, he had to report himself every like two or three months to the military post. So I think they suspect that my father is also part of this forbidden uh, party or like everyone at that time accused, like if you're right. very critical, you're accused as a communist. That's what happened. So maybe, you know, I have a, a good friend, Supriano, Supriano, who works for Voice of America and he grew up in a small village in East Java and he said that the children used to play with Wayang Rumput, uh, grass shadow puppets, and everybody knew, you know, who was red and who was white, that everybody, that everybody knew the family histories of all of their neighbors, that um, it's just something you yeah. grow up with. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's like, I feel that stigma and then I have to be careful um, if I have, if I like, I talk like I mentioned the name of my grandfather, for example, because my grandfather is the leader of this um, group in in our village. So it's it's kind of dangerous for me to talk like to mention even the name of my grandfather. So I was like I experienced like this um, situation or like uh, how the people treat our family during the Suharto um, regime. So I. I I am. That's why that that feeling of social injustice that shaped shaped me. Like we don't have this access to the job. We don't have a lot of money, and then we cannot. We didn't feel that feeling of freedom like the other family, like the other think, family. I, this is so interesting because I think this actually does explain a lot about how you are drawn. To writing about marginalized people, whether it is LGBTQ Indonesians or whether it's a, a young woman who gets drawn into ISIS and is willing to be a suicide bomber, that you know that you write write very sympathetically about how someone who's poor and just kind of looking to be noticed would be drawn into something like that. Yeah. Um, I have that sensitivity because I came from that place. So um, my my father also he he is very smart. He sent me not to like a, a state school, but he sent me to a Catholic school where I meet like so many students with a different background, like Buddhist, like Hindu, and then um, Catholic and Christian. So. I was like the minority in that school. So I, I experienced how like my friends, how become a minority in that school for like um, three years at the first time. So, uh, and then I know exactly how like my friends feel uh, during the um, Suharto regime. I mean, after, even after Suharto fall. And then um, I also like, um, experience how my friends as a majority treat me and then how they like um, compromise with me uh, during the Ramadan for example they, they they like follow me like stop eating during the Ramadan because they want to respect me so I learned a lot about 
so that's one also like shaped me is because my uh, father sent me to that Catholic school. Right, but it's but you you told me be- earlier, um, and I've observed this too that you also your your family um, is Muslim and you're practicing Muslim and um, uh, it's I'm it's it's so interesting to see you this morning because in in all of your well in your documentary you're wearing headscarf right you wear a turban and um, so you so you're a, a practicing Muslim yeah um actually my family is not Islam um, conservative but Islam mm-hmm. Africa. But uh, this is like a very long story, but I'm going to like wrap it in very short. Okay. <laughs> so uh, when I was, uh, this is uh, related to my article about the, how is this, um, the making of uh, is this female bumber. Right. So when I was in university, I was radicalized. So yeah. Wait, that, radicalized in what way? Uh, they approached me, this group of conservative group, and they introduced me about Kilafah. So wow. I learned about that, and I did believe that uh, we need Kilafah, and I wore hijab at that time. I do believe. And because I was young, and that feeling of social injustice makes me believe that I need a solution, and the only solution in front of me is Kilafa. So that's why I understand when I interview her, uh, Dian, uh, Dian, who is like the ISIS boomer. So I'm, I'm, I was very sympathized to her because I was there. I know that you're like confused with this experiencing like living in a poor family and then you don't have anyone to talk and then someone give you solution, Hilafa. So I know exactly how she feels. She was lost, completely lost, I know. So that's why I can write that story because I was radicalized. So uh, when I, and then I graduated from university, I was still like very, very conservative. And then um, I become a journalist. It's opened my eyes because I meet so many people. It saved me like in a different level. So why did you, how did you become a journalist and why did you want to become a journalist? This is a, I mean, that's, you wouldn't think that most young women who become radicalized in university (laughs) then would turn to journalism. So what, what was, what actually happened? So uh, again, because that feeling of social injustice that I experienced uh, with my family and because we were so poor and then, um, and then, um, I remember that um, that grieving when I found out that my grandfather never come back from that after he 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 was uh, arrested and then jailed. We have no idea, but pre- so pre- you don't know what happened to him. No one knows in your family what mm-hmm. happened to him. No, no one wants to tell me, but my my mother said to me that. Um, he is he 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 didn't like pass away like normal <laughs> grandfather mm. but he went to the jail and someone told my mother that he, uh, he was killed so uh, but we, we have no evidence at all so this is just our assumption uh, from the news that we received um, at that time I feel like my life is completely different. Like um, it's so much grieving that I have to, um, I have to finish that feeling uh, encounter that I don't know how to, how to process that because I was, I was still young. I was still in like um, high school, I think, or like early, like in the university. So that's why I'm looking for an answer. So. But um, when I was in university, I know that I love writing. I don't know, like, I, I feel like in writing, I can do, like, healing. So I can, I can practice healing because, I don't know, it's, it's like I have that energy to write more rather than to talk to people, for example. It's, it's hard. So, so I love it. And then the, the only job that actually related to writing is being a journalist and also like well mm, I don't want I mean like I want to write something that I think it's right for me so how did how did you were you a student journalist or how did you 
I mean, as, as you know, and as so many of our friends know, it's very hard to become a, a journalist, a professional journalist, particularly if you are freelancing. And, and you seem to have had an extremely successful career with this. So what, act, what was your first job? How did you get interested in it? And then tell us how you got into journalism. It's a miss my first job. <laughs> what is? Yeah, one of my friends told me um, we were both like so poor. I have to repeat it because everyone uh, had to know that I I was I had no privilege before, um, and then now I I have this privilege. So my friends, I, I, I did because of Zoom. I didn't hear what you said. Where was your first job? Um, my first job is a journalist. Um, my first job is a journalist in. So this is the story that I want to be a journalist because I want to do something and contribute something to Indonesia because I think like uh, what happens to my family. I think I need to like I want Indonesia to be like what I want like um, no more genocide for example no more mis discrimination to the. So who? So where was the first job? Who first hired you? Um, it was like training job in Jawa Post, actually, okay. and I didn't pass it. <laughs> so the editor said that I don't have the talent to be a journalist. It's only three months. And I say, I, I didn't give up and I try again and I apply again. And then, um, and then I got a job in Jakarta at first in like Femina Group. It's like a magazine for women, like writing feature. And I have to wait like for one year. Then I applied to Tempo. And it was my friend who forced me to apply because I don't have that confidence. I say that, wow, this is like very serious journalism. I know I have that dream that, but like 2000 uh, people like apply to this job. I just found out and I was just like my friend just forced me like you have to try okay but I don't have money okay I will give you money so she gave me money um and then yeah I still remember she helped me and then I apply and then um I got that job in Tempo and then my oh. life has changed like it's completely where, where I began when I began where I began my dream like I manifest my dream that I wrote. Like I know that Tempo has that um, credibility. It's like Time in USA or like Sydney Morning Herald in in. And, and we never met at Tempo when you were working there. Yeah, I'm... because I was just like, oh my god, very like a junior reporter. Even Leila Escudori, who is very famous <laughs> film uh, leading film critic, she had no idea that. I attend his class like every week and I was in the corner and I, I was like nerd and no one knows me, but I have this, this like um, spirit or like I have this dream that I want to be the best in my class in Tempo and I want to be the best reporter even in Jakarta. That was, that was me. That was like my friend. So after Tempo, then you were at Rappler, right? Um... And and then and and now you now you make a living freelance writing right or which is very impressive. Yeah, after like five year five years in Tempo, uh, because the salary is uh, too low for me living in Jakarta, and then um, I decide to like actually I still have have another dream that I want to. So I always like develop myself and then revise or update my dreams. And then every five years, I have never stopped dreaming about something, doing something. So when I like five years in Tempo, I feel like, I think I'm enough. I'm going to like write for international publication, <laughs> which I have no idea how to start it. And then, oh, this is like a new opportunity in Rappler. Maybe I can start because I can write like in uh, to language like Indonesia and English, but but it's not like often, but I still can learn how to do that. And I'm, I connect with like the best journalists like Maria Ressa, for example. So I try Rappler and then after one and a half 
a year, I think that is enough. I can do this freelance by myself because I just want to challenge myself whether I can publish story in international publication because I know that not so many local journalists do that because uh, we are not native speakers. So our chance is very little, but I say that, well, I can do that. Let's try. I mean, I need, I need to challenge myself and I need to, I, I read some story of the uh, foreign correspondent and I think like I can write better they don't know the context of my country so that's how it started it's just sometime for me like I just push myself and then I want to try something new because every five years I feel like if I have done this I want to do something more so it's always like that the other um, I think the other thing that you and I have in common are where we may have crossed we would say crossed paths was with Yayasan Pantau and Andreas Harsono that um, you have been, who is now the head of uh, uh, the uh, Indonesian head of um, Human Rights Watch. And, and so you, you've known him for a long time too, right? And, and his work um, with Yayasan Pantau, which is yeah. dedicated to quality journalism. I met him first time after um the FBI, Indonesia Islamic Defender Front, um, intimidated me and harassed me during my reporting with Rappler. Um, and then I think everyone like pay attention to my work after that because of the FBI, thanks to FBI. And, and that then, was because of your the LGBTQ stuff, right? That you were writing yeah, that they didn't like that. 1965 massacre. And then uh, so many people reach me out and then one of them is Andres Harsono and then he offered me to uh, uh, to attend the class, um, class pa Pantau. And then I think like I'm, I'm the old, oldest student, but I don't have anything to do. So I just attend. And then he asked me also like to contribute um, to teach in the class. So I just share actually like I, I don't have I don't have any background on journalism like you, for example. And I don't know actually the theory. I, I'm just like someone working in the field. So what I'm what I told to my student is just what I uh, what I got from the field. So that is actually weird teaching because I just have like my background like bachelor degree I don't have that expertise or like that title at all so it's weird to share that like teaching in front of the student no, that's not I mean I, I don't have a degree in journalism in fact um, most of the journalists I know I have backgrounds more like yours um, that they didn't study journalism in university um, if if so, so it, it is very interesting how your history, your family history, and, um, you know, which is interesting how it's mixed, you know, you um, strong Muslim side, the strong socialist leftist side, um, concern about justice, which is both Islam and the left are concerned about justice. And then you, then you become a journalist and and this is your passion your your life's work to expose injustice it sounds like to write about to write about things that are wrong that need to be that need to be fixed and and you have taken on so many so many really difficult questions like uh, and unpopular and supported and written about unpopular groups like in Indonesia LGBTQ people are still marginalized and you know, the uh, former political prisoners, families still marginalized. And then um, uh, Pop Ones, which is a, a, a huge interest of yours, I know. And, and you, you wrote to me earlier how, how you see the, first of all, the connection between what happened in Indonesia in 1965 and what happened in Papua in 1969 and the current situation. You wanna talk a little bit about that? What, what, what links 1965, 1969, and now in your mind? Yeah, um, uh, I visit West Papua for the first time in 2012. Um, my editor in Tempo sent me, and that was the first time I report and write story about West Papua. And when the first time 
I arrived there and meet the West Papuan. I already feel like connected with them, with their story, with, um, I don't know, I feel like home with these people. There must be something. So I learned about the history after after that visit. Um, I, I witnessed by myself, like they were living like extremely poor until today, until today. And then I wondering why. And then I heard so many stories the, about the people get killed. And I was curious. And then after that trip, um, actually with the Ministry of Education, thanks to them for sponsoring me, um, I got like, um, like um, the important education for my life, meeting the West Papuan. And then... After I learned the history, I was shocked because there is like connection between the even in Indonesia during the 1965 and then what happened during the 1969s when the West Papuans uh, fought for like a uh, fourth in a referendum, like called like act of a free choice. And then I found out that it's actually the background is the same. It's, it's, it's a Cold War. And of course, the main actor is USA. And then um, the USA, um, they have like um, a general that very close to them and become their puppet, Suharto. And then that's how like, um, I mean, um, to win the war uh, of a, with Russia, because Russia is very close with Sukarno and and USA like um Kolb Suharto eh, sorry Kolb Sukarno uh, using Suharto and then um after 4 years and then they moved to West Papua the only reason because West Papua is very rich and then American company like Freeport they have this like business interest and then that's why I, I mean with also like West Papua or New Guinea Island in the Pacific region is very important uh, uh, for like any um, country like Russia and then USA. So that's why, that's why um, actually this is not about Suharto and Sukarno in West Papua, but uh, but this is about the 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 uh, USA and and the Russia like they are uh, really yeah the context I think. You're absolutely right, is the Cold War and the concern that first that Indonesia would go um, side with the communists and mm -hmm. that, so you're right. So the, the US government liked Suharto and then yeah. was also concerned about Papua as maybe being too communist and it was just better yeah. for the American interests if yeah. Indonesia and was- And then actually West Papua is also the victim. And then um, what makes different that uh, we have like, um, I mean, like uh, the the 1965. Even finally, we can, we can, um, like, we can release all the political prisoner. If I'm not mistaken, is 1979. But in West Papua, that even like people getting arrested and getting killed, it's still happening until today. So I feel that I know that feeling of uh, this young West Papuans, uh, like losing their grandfather or like their father because they get killed by Indonesian military, for example. I know like, I know that situation. And I know right now, like this West Papuan, what West Papuan experience right now, like under the Indonesian regime, whoever is the president, it's like what my family experienced during the Suharto regime. So there is no- so You feel a, a real parallel, a real connection with the yeah. Papuan struggle. So that's why I feel that, oh, I need to write about West Papua uh, because um, during the Suharto regime, I think like the journalists, Indonesian journalists also try to get the story out about uh, this dictatorship of Suharto. So um, I'm, I'm going to do the same and then I'm going to do my job and I'm going to make sure that uh, I, I have to like make the government accountable because they killed uh, this West Pop one, like this civil. So I have to do right. that. Well, now I have a, a, a several questions for you about this. One thing that's interesting 
as you know, um, it's very hard for international journalists even to get into Papua, right? That they, they have to go through a very complex permit uh, um, process and they may not get the permit. And then once they're there, they're very closely monitored by, uh, by security people. And um, so what do you, do you think that as an, as an Indonesian journalist, you are able to report on Papua in ways that international journalists cannot, um, or do sometimes internationalists, international journalists have advantages that you don't have? Could, could you talk a little bit about, because you've done everything. You've worked as an Indonesian journalist for Tempo. You've worked as, a, as an Indonesian journalist for international publications. How, how, how do you see this situation in Papua for journalists, both Indonesian, international? What are the, what are the ups and downs of being local and of being international yeah um i think like when when i visit west papua um when i was still like a local journalist uh i was heavily monitored by the military member who follow me everywhere uh they argue that um i i couldn't go anywhere without them because they are afraid the um, OPM or like West Papua National Liberation Army will shoot me, which later I knew that uh, OPM didn't shot uh, civil, but only police and military member. So it, they just like, um, it, 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 it's just an excuse. So I, when I was like um, working for international publication, when I come back, I have like more freedom because uh, I actually have to report to like foreign affairs ministry, but I never do that because um, I feel like I don't have to do that. This is like freedom of press. I can do anything. Like there is a guarantee on that. But actually, now is that be just to follow up really quickly? Is that because you are an Indonesian international journalist, or like if I went there, would I be monitored more than you are? Or um, yeah, yeah, I think like. Um, I, I think like if I'm, I'm working for the local publication, I will like heavily monitor. Um, that was experience. But when I become like a freelance journalist, actually when I, when my friends, actually some of my friends, um, like Rebecca Hens, for example, from BBC and the other, they also like heavily monitor. But I think the output, it's still like more, for, for the military more dangerous if you're working and writing in Bahasa Indonesia because you will educate the Indonesian audience. That's why they are afraid. But because I was a freelance and actually I have to report to the um, Foreign Affairs Ministry, for example, or whatever the, the authority, but I didn't do that. It's just like my idea that I just ignore them. And I have that um, option to ignore them if we just like, believe in our safety protocol will be fine. So that's why they cannot touch the freelance. So that's the benefit being a freelance because you, so you, so use you. Uh, like, are you reporting? They, they don't have the evidence until the article is out. Do you think that the, that the stories that, do you think international media are interested in different stories than Indonesian media are interested in, in Papua or is it the same? Do you see a difference between, for example, what Tempo wants to write about Papua and what The Guardian is willing to write about Papua or wants to write about Papua? Is there a difference um, in coverage? I think the same. I think like it's very similar, but um, the output is very different. It's, it's very similar. There is only like usually only a single big story from West Papua, uh, like for example, the killing of that pastor like couple couple weeks ago and it's become like a big issue because he, he is a pastor. And then like uh, the uprising in West Papua last year uprising, it's also like big news. In, in West Papua, like it's always, there is always like one single big issue. And, and because uh, nothing happened in West Papua except people getting killed, and then um, again, to, to, you're, I would push back because your own work. There are lots of issues. You look at you look at the power of of big um, forestry forestry companies. You look at the oil palm industry. You look at um, 
malnutrition and poverty. Um, you look at political violence. So even though you're right that like one incident, everybody covers it, but in general, I wonder, is, does inter, is international media interested in bigger topics and issues than Indonesian media are, or are they all interested in the same things? Oh, yeah. That, yeah. Um, uh, Indonesian media, they are more interested on a story about criminal in West Papua, but I don't think they go like farther more, except Tempo, because they have like investigative department. Um, they, they, what kind they, of criminal? What, what do you mean by criminal? Who, who, criminal, what kind of criminal? Like, for example, um, every single story about uh, West Papua National Labor Army because they call oh. the OPM as a, a criminal armed group. Okay. So that that's okay. something criminal like that, or like the story about, um, uh, for example, uh, West Papua get arrested because uh, they were drunk, for example. But there is no story about the police or military getting drunk and kill okay. the children in in Highland of West so Papua. For so, so their interest. So, so Indonesian media, um, you would you think are more interested in the OPM, the Free Papua Movement, the Independence yes. Movement, and they see that as criminal. Yes. Um, it's, um, it's, for them, it's national interest, and it has to be like right. a headline. Right. Then but I, like you say that that some of the environmental issues I know Tempo has worked on, right? That it's so it's not. Um, I was thinking about one of the things that you that I know in your and you do so many things, including um, what I work for or edit a newsletter, a, week, a bi-weekly newsletter in English. And you've talked a lot about Pop One Lives Matter, which has mirrored the Black Lives Matter story. Is that something that is Indonesian, is Indonesian media as interested in the, the issue of racism as international media is, or is it about the same? No. I don't think Indonesian media cover like enough about the racism story in West Papua. It is because the Indonesian media itself is very racist to West Papuan. Um, the way that they mention of uh, the West Papuan, like for example, the way that they cover story, they only um, they only interview the security, like for example, the police and the military. Right. Like they didn't consider West Papuan as a re reliable source it's also racist for me because West right. Papuan is a victim and you have to like even like for example this case of pastor who who was killed in in the high clan of uh, West Papua so only like um couple of Indonesian media quote the resident like Orang Asli Papua or West Papuan in their story. They only quote the police and military. But when it's come to West Papuan, they say that um we have to check, but they were the witness. And then you can check with the other organization, for example, Amnesty International Indonesia or the church community, but they didn't do that. Right. Well, I have I, I have a question about this, and this is a this is a little bit harder question to ask. Um uh, our friend Andreas from Human Rights Watch, these are issues he's very concerned about, right? About, uh, about the discrimination against pop ones just based on race and, and um, about the power of, of the big uh, timber companies and the big um, uh, oil palm companies. And he's concerned about um, poverty and malnutrition and other human rights issues. But so how, but you're not, you don't work for Human Rights Watch, you're a journalist. So how do you see your work as being different from that of activists? Or do you see yourself as an activist? Is, is, is your journalism basically activism or what, or is it not? Is, it, is there a difference between I say what you do and what Andreas does? I, it's very different <laughs> with what he does. Um, I, ca I cannot say I'm, I'm an activist because um, we have this like, code of ethic or like a process in journalism which I cannot like put like uh, my opinion or like advocacy or like personal concerns in my article mm -hmm. all like processed by my editor like mm -hmm. I, I I didn't even like um, 
affiliate with any organization like it's different with him like he is like an activist and working for human rights watch but i sure. have no affiliation at all and then what i'm doing is that i'm doing my job because no one wants to cover this story i think like the story about minority all that story that sensitive thing that um i think our newsroom in indonesia yeah. for them is still taboo and then we don't have that capability or resources to do that. So I love, you, I love right. Tempo and I think Tempo is the best, the best place to learn about how to cover all this issue. I learned even it's in Tempo, it's still like there is like a limitation to write this kind of story. But by being freelance and working with so many editor like from like international publication, I got that I learned from them and I it shaped me how like to see some issue and I, I feel that that's how um, I can came up with that story because my editor like um, give me that direction and then give me that knowledge and give me like like discuss with them how they could cover like for example the story like about environment so I developed my skill on um, reporting on journalism from all the how do you international how do you um, how do you fact check what the OPM says? Um, just like you say that, well, you know, if you only listen to the police and you only listen to the military, you get you get one side of things. How do you how do you fact check what the OPM tells you? I usually not really quote them. <laughs> mm. I usually will like going to that story starting quoting the residents or or like everyone like as a witness whether it is indonesian or not or west papuan um uh, and i will come i will like quote more like for example like in um, independent institution like for example church community or like um another community or like ngo for example i used to work with them a lot like for example i checked so many things with amnesty international indonesia during the 2019 uprising and then um if i need a quote i will call like opm like for example or the police like but it is like the last option so um if there is any like shooting situation the first person that i'm looking for is the witness itself mm -hmm. so that's the st standard that my editor always like told me like we have to find the witness like at least we have find like four or five people confirm uh, what happened on the ground so that's what I did that's why it takes like a day for me to break the news the day after because I have to like get the confirmation from at least like three or four or five and then I have to talk with the the other independent community like for example check with the church community or like there there are so many organization even check with jubi and suara papua i said i got the information i want to break the news but i have the confirm i need you to confirm and then and then the last i will call the police because i need like because indonesian government uh, uh us usually like the the per like the one who shot the like the civil or the West Papuan usually like Indonesian military. So I have to talk with the police and the military and they, they are welcome actually. And then after that, I talk to the OPM. Usually it's the last option. So it's not it's not my first option to like uh, put them in the headline or like lead mm. of my article. Usually like the last option. Yeah, it's funny, yesterday in, in one of my, in my journalism class, we had a guest speaker and he was saying that, you know, he was saying that, that he was talking about his own work and he said, it's, it's all a product of reporting. It's not assumptions and that you have to be able to defend every sentence um, and you have to, you know, be able to, to, as he says, you have to he used the term, you have to be able to prosecute your own journalism. You have to be sure that everything you've said can be defended. Um, and I imagine even more so in the case of Papua, where, you know, a lot of people are reading very carefully what you say. Um, one thing that I, I've, in preparing for this, I've now, I've, I've now looked at uh, Mongo Bay's work. I've looked at Al Jazeera's work. I've looked at your work um, for the, the Gecko uh, 
project. And it's interesting to me, it seems like if we talk about Papua and just environmental problems, there's so many different players, right? There's the, there's the big international companies mm -hmm. and then there's Jakarta and then there's local political, local politicians in Papua and then there are the, the, the heads of the suku and then they're just ordinary people, you know, and that they're, it, it's hard for me at least, it's hard to pin the blame on any one group because all of them are sort of working together to create this bad situation. I, I was wondering, do you think that it is, are Indonesian journalists more likely to say blame the big international companies than to say, well, part of it's Jakarta or maybe part of it is corrupt local leaders? Do you, do you see a difference there between the way international journalists think and the way Indonesian journalists think about who's to blame? Why is this situation so bad? Um, I think Indonesian journalists, um, I cannot generalize because it's it's very diverse, but most of them will like more like talking that uh, it, it's the fault of the local elite. And mm. I think I, I cannot blame them because even the local elite, they betray the West Pop one. It's true, but it's mm. not the whole story. The whole story, it's not only the local uh, elite, but it's also like um, other like party that you mentioned, like it's also Jakarta involved and, and then also like the big company and also like the politic, geopolitic in the Pacific itself. So. If we talk about the real victim, it's the ordinary West Pop one. So I, I personally like that international journalists can can um, tend to look at the uh, uh, role of the international, uh, like the, the foreign country, I think. But right. Indonesian journalists, so I think like both of them, um, they need to tell like the whole story. And I don't think like they, they, they have their own, like yeah. one, one of the story tend to blame the local elite and the other like tend to like questions the foreign country involvement or like foreign business involvement in West Papua. But I think also <laughs> elite in West Papua is also the big and the part of the problem. If West Papua, like for example, declared for independence, there will be like the first corruptor and the corruption case. If, um, to switch gears a little bit, um, I, I hope that the members of, of the audience, people listening to this, have already had a chance to see your wonderful new documentary, Our Mother's Land, which I guess is produced by uh, Manga Bay and the Gecko Project. And it was, it was screened at the festival, the premiere on October 29. And people who didn't get to see it then can, um, I guess, probably about the time that this, this interview is aired, we'll be able to, to look it up on YouTube, right? The title of it is Our Mother's Land. And, um, and this is your first documentary and congratulations. And uh, you have such a lovely manner. I, I got to see it, special screening before this interview. And um, I guess you visit, what, four different places in Indonesia, right? Is it four or five? Uh, four. Uh, east, um, a place in Java and then in Sulawesi and then in Timor. And then Aceh. Aceh, yeah. And it's interesting. I, I was thinking what you were just saying about, you know, there's international companies, there's Jakarta, there's corrupt local leaders. Um, in each of this, the situations that you report on here, it seems like it seems like it's Jakarta that gets in the way. Is that is that accurate? That sort of the ultimate problem is kind of Jakarta betrays the provincial leaders, or is it the provincial leaders? do what they want to do anyway? Or what, if you had to kind of draw some conclusions on the basis of your, this wonderful film about the, these yeah, strong women who, um, what do you think? The case of West Papua and the other province in Indonesia, I think like it's a collaboration between the local elite and then Jakarta. And then again, like the victim is the real ordinary, like for example, farmer and fisherman, and especially women and children, they were, they are very affected by this like uh, big project that damaged the environment. So that's what I capture that I, I don't see any documentary film or like even like 
writing series focus on women in environment and I want to take that challenge and then uh, report like across Indonesia and make a documentary film and uh, it, it was like actually based on it's it is actually based on my reportings in 2016 when the first time I met Sukina uh, again because I know that um, I, I feel like because I know where I came from and then where, where when I meet these people and then I know that exactly that's the problem because um, no one ever like heard like for example government have to give them a chance to like um, uh, express their opinion or like have their own voice about the project at all. So mm -hmm. there is no, um, there is no like, um, how do you call it? Um, there is no like medium to communicate. So the only way to communicate for them uh, to, to talk with the government is that truth, like very extreme protest. Like for example, the condemned farmer, they cement their feet. And then the the order like waving the fabric in in Molo is Nusa Tenggara, so I think people like um, they 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 protest because there is no way anymore they can communicate with this um, Jakarta, for example, like government. So th that's that's why and 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 the 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 I think like my favorite is that because women take the lead and. As someone who like uh, raised in Japanese family, and then sometimes Japanese family say that woman will end up in the kitchen. That's all my family member always told me. Oh, whatever you can write in international publication, but you will end up in the kitchens if you get married. So uh, when I met this all like um, female defenders, female land defenders, what I witness is like the opposite side what the society and my family told me that they can be the leader of the movement and they have their own voice and they even need the president in the palace and like for example that story of one woman uh, Eva Bande in Sulawesi Jokowi really respect her um, and he, he she was granted um, clemency by Jokowi so I think it's very par powerful that that the role of this woman uh, to defend their land and then to like protect our environment. It is very, it's a very powerful documentary and you have such a nice way of, of, of asking them questions and letting them tell their stories. And they, um, they're, they're all, each of the stories is, is it's fascinating. I don't know how to act or to ask because it's very sensitive. And then I saw so many journalists making a mystic and television for example when there is like um one of the mom family member uh uh killed in a disaster for example and the presenter of the tv asks how do you feel it's a wrong question so sometimes i ask them like a close question like for example so um you are losing your best friend so because i i know that she's losing your best friend I know that she is losing her best friend. I want her to tell more. So that's how I, I like trying to be polite because I don't want to make a mistake asking. Sure. Quick. No, it's, it's, it's beautifully done. And, and I, I guess it's interesting to me about February, how we look at your work and there are these, these things that tie it together that um, not just giving voice to the voiceless, but um, showing the strength of people who we ordinarily don't pay any attention to, um, whether it's these women environmental activists who are who are housewives and farmers and weavers and you know they're they didn't want to be polit politicians or be involved in politics, but they saw something that was wrong and they wanted to fix it, yeah. which as you know is also very Islamic. Um, yeah, you know, I think I think because um, I have that sensitivity, I I have that benefit of like my past experience with my family. I have that sensitivity, so that's why I think like when I feel like this could be like very powerful story if I wrote, if I write this story. So that that's how that's how I think like it's naturally I have that. That's why everyone said it. How do you like came up with a story? And then they, they, they feel like, are uh, you writing like 
different story or like dangerous story and sensitive story i think the the answer is yeah because that sensitivity is naturally in me so that you my- have a you have a real knack for picking out unusual stories so i mean we we don't have much time left but i am curious about your story on the um female suicide bomber because i guess in a way she, she's the same kind of person right but she got on this path that was not a good one um what was it like interviewing her and what finally happens to her where is she now um she was just like uh like me like like you she's like very normal mm-hmm. um when i start the uh, i mean it's 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 very normal just like us uh, mm-hmm. but when we start talking about what like this disturb her like for example like this government and then they always like discriminate my community and and mm-hmm. I don't trust them because uh, they arrest anyone who think um, conservatives, for example. Yeah, it, the fact that Densus 88 arrest like the wrong, uh, like accuse someone as jihadist and uh, arrest the wrong person. So that's what, what happened. So um, that when I start like talking about uh, her background, like how she was raised, she's very normal. But when it's come to like, um, the first time that she feel like, what do you think about Indonesia, for example, is she was very different. So that's I know that that's like it. It's she 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 looks like she like split the personality. I can feel it, um, uh, and because I was I, like, someone who already like radicalized, I can zoom in and zoom out, right? And then when she, she talk about something about uh, Indonesia, uh, I feel like she split the 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 she split the personality, and I think it's important, and I think it's very crucial, and I think it's interesting for the like psychiatry or psycholog to to like examine that split of personality. It's it's very like, and then she laugh haha, and then see completely like with different face so i can feel it something um, if, if 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 people who are listening to this are interested um this was published uh the the story your story the making of a female isis bomber was published in new narrative which is a wonderful publication everyone should be subscribing to because it's excellent and uh february writes for it a lot i mean and we're we've, we're really running out of time but one thing just in talking to you today it seems to me that one of your great strengths is you have this enormous amount of empathy that you are able to, to, and maybe it comes from inside, you're able to see yourself in the struggles of other people and then to, to help use that to help understand why they are the way they are, whether they are a somewhat misguided suicide bomber or whether they are a, a woman who is fighting a you know, a mining company or, or, um, or trying to get justice for, you know, a, 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 a family member that, that you, this empathy of yours, I think is, is an incredible strength you have. Um, we, we really are out of time now. So I have to, I have to bring things to a close. I hope everybody has a chance, uh, first of all, to see our mother's land. You can watch about February in action um, and you'll be able to see it on YouTube. If you haven't already seen it, and um, and definitely Google her and read all of her stuff. She's got lots of very interesting work, and she's still so young. So I know we'll be hearing a lot from you in the future. And um, I very much appreciate this opportunity. And so let me now read the closing statement. So, Kambali 2020 was made possible with the support of Yayasan Mutra Swari Saraswati Patron Program and their donors. The patron program was created to seek assistance for the survival of both festivals and the foundation. By making a valuable contribution to the Yayasan patron program, you will be directly involved in delivering both festivals in due time. Your contribution will guarantee the future of Indonesia's most meaningful cross-cultural platform of words, ideas, culture, and the creative arts. And you can follow Ubud Writers Festival on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, or visit ubudwritersfestival.com for more information about the patron program. I think you can also follow Bat Febri on uh, Twitter, Instagram, etc. Um, 
this has been a real pleasure and uh, good luck to you in your in your future endeavors. Thank you. Okay, thank you.